I am here today to talk about developing mRNA for therapy. But how I got here, I have to say something about where I came from. I am coming from Hungary, where I studied at the University of Szeged, and I went there because uh, in the same time, the Biological Research Center was open there. And then my dream was to work in this Biological Research Center. So as a student, I already started and uh, went there. And uh, first, I went to the lipid labs. Everybody was thinking that it is very boring because everybody was excited about genetics and lipids. I, you know, who get excited about lipids, but I was. And here, my mentors are who advised me. And um, what was interesting is that one day, uh, the biochem, one part of the biochemistry department uh, representative coming, they wanted us to isolate phospholipids. And uh, we had to follow a very old procedure, make, preparing it from co-brain. Then it came handy that my father was butcher, so I was very easily handling the material. And we did phospholipids, and then what we did, we, in, we wrapped it DNA and delivered to mammalian cells. So this was my first experience in the laboratory, and we already delivering plasmid DNA to the cells and demonstrated the encoded uh, protein was produced. It is very important to make your hand wet, start with something, because the rest of my life, this first experiment followed me. But when I finished my uh, studies, I started in uh, the RNA laboratory. My supervisor, Janu Thomas, actually, together with uh, Furuichi, you know, he was published a paper. In this paper, my supervisor made cap analog for the RNA they needed in um, uh, New Jersey, Aaron Shatkin and colleague, they needed reference material. So in day one, I learned that the messenger RNA has a cap. But my role was to make a two prime, five prime linked oligoadenylate, which we work together with Janos Ludwig. Again, another message here. Even today, I work together with Janos Ludwig. We work in the laboratory as a graduate student. And we were in different countries, but we collaborated even for day. So this uh, molecule, this 2 prime, 5 prime oligoadenylate, which I synthesized enzymatically, chemically, started my RNA work. This uh, small molecule, this was just uh, three nucleotides containing small molecule, actually oligoadenylate synthesized in our body. It activates RNAs L, which was supposed to be uh, cleaving and degrading viral RNA. And this molecule was thought that responsible for uh, the interferon-induced antiviral effect. So in that point, I learned a lot to work with RNA. And in 1985, I moved to the United States, where I keep working on this kind of molecule, did uh, introduce different kind of modification. And, uh, but this molecule was still, we couldn't use for antiviral effect. And when, in 1980s, the major enemy number one was uh, HIV. We used uh, double-stranded RNA, mismatched double-stranded RNA for treating patient. This uh, RNA, double-stranded RNA, induced interferon. And um, unfortunately, the patient, uh, HIV patient uh, interferon system was already compromised, so it was um, not helping them much. But uh, at that point, I already worked with RNA. I synthesized, labeled them, working with different enzymes to modify them. Here, in the, we generated double-stranded RNA and learned a lot about the process. But I did not work at that point with the messenger RNA. So talking about messenger RNA, I have to say the messenger RNA was discovered in 1961, and it took uh, 60 years by last year when the first uh, mRNA uh, was uh, FDA approved in the form of uh, COVID-19 LMP mRNA vaccine. What happened during the 60 years? So mostly that I can tell you that two major things which I find important, 1978, first time mRNA was delivered, and this was isolated RNA to the cell and the coded protein was detected. And then the second one in 1984, when first time in a tube, we could synthesize an RNA 
of our design. But the rest of it was just a little optimization, gradual increase, and incremental improvement. So what happened? So scientists discovering this RNA, you can see that both paper, Nature paper 61, mentioned this is unstable. So the RNA was very, this messenger RNA is very unstable. But with this discovery, we learned that what is the information flow, which we know today, is that uh, the DNA, which is in a eukaryote in the nuclei, it transcribed to an RNA, and then in the cytoplasm, in the ribosome, protein is produced. And this is our building block. The next uh, important step was that scientists, of course, couldn't uh, synthesize the RNA. They tried to investigate how, how this RNA is. And then one important discovery was made right here in Japan when they discovered the phi prime and this RNA, which was um, a very interesting uh, molecules in the, here in Fu Furuichi and here in Japan proposed that this is, this is probably the structure of the phi prime end. And later, actually, Furuichi went to the US and together with Aaron Shetkin did further study. They demonstrated that this sequence, this uh, structure is critical to get good translation, good protein production. When they removed, there were no protein produced. And actually, three consecutive papers published the structure when finally uh, uh, proved that what it is. And, Probably 1975 was the year of the cap because by end of the year, even the enzymes, which in the viral construct, they can put to the mRNA this uh, uh, element, they were discovered. And uh, if you get a Moderna vaccine, you probably get the RNA, which was uh, enzymatically kept, like this one. And if you get the Pfizer-BioNTech, it was incorporated during in vitro transcription. So some scientists were investigating how the mRNA looked, and others, they work with isolated RNA, where they could isolate from reticulocytes, which is, an, which is a precursor of red blood cells, so it is enriched in uh, um, uh, globin. And uh, when they isolated, first in the 60s, they translated in the cell lysate. Some of them later injected in oocyte, demonstrated that the protein is produced. And very important experiment was done in 1978 when the mRNA was wrapped in the liposome and delivered primary mammalian cells. And at the end of the fusion, they could demonstrate that uh, beta globin protein was produced. So this was the first mRNA production, 1978. So what was the next important step? Because we wouldn't be here if we wouldn't be able to do in a tube in our uh, desire, desire to make any kind of uh, RNA. And this was done in uh, Harvard University, Douglas Melton, Paul Krieg, who identified that phage RNA polymerase, they first SP6 RNA polymerase they selected, and uh, in the following year, T7 RNA polymerase, and they generated an mRNA. This is how the mRNA looks. It has already the cap structure you are already familiar with. It has 5 prime UTR, 3 prime UTR, and the coding sequence. They had human uh, beta interferon coding sequence. And um, I might mention here important things. When they published this paper in 1984, in the same year, you already could purchase uh, the RNA polymerase. So everything was in the 80s, uh, this kind of certain things was discovered and immediately commercially available. So what they did with the RNA, they injected to frog oocyte. This is a large cells, so it was easy to inject. And then when they incubated overnight these uh, injected oocyte, they found that uh, they secreted human interferon, and then it was functional, inhibited the virus. So this was a very critical step. So what happened after that? You can see that the 90s, they injected, people injected to animals. They injected a uh, uh, reporter encoding mRNA, and then like vasopressin RNA, where they could already show some uh, biological effect. What they did in 93, 94, they uh, generated mRNA, which was uh, uh, infectious disease vaccine. And then uh, 95, 96, and beyond, you could read mostly about uh, mRNA use for cancer vaccine. 
So it, it was easy. Every year, just one publication, not like uh, these days, several publications per, per days. So it is difficult to follow. But what happened? Why, why, like scientists who published 30 years ago this paper, never ever published again with anything with mRNA? I tried to follow them for years. But what happened is that the mRNA had only one thing, problem. It was unstable, it was inflammatory. So as a result of it, very small amount of protein was produced for a very short time. And uh, everybody kind of left the field after one publication. So what happened during those years from 90s is that the mRNA was gradually improved and the formulation was improved because the RNA was labeled. It had to be wrapped up in something to protect. So the two field was developing and improving independently and sometimes together. That what led to reaching 19, uh, 2021. So I started to work in cardiology and started to work with mRNA in 1989. In the uh, University of Pennsylvania, there was uh, many people work on the gene therapy, and uh, Akihiro was working with adenoviral uh, deliveries. But uh, me and uh, with Elliot Barnett, and we were working with mRNA coding for uh, th therapeutic protein. And uh, why we were so excited? Because uh, when we delivered this urokinase uh, coding mRNA, which uh, translated in the cell, and for beef to be functional, it had to be modified, uh, glycosylated, the carboxy terminal had to be processed, and somehow the cell knew all of these things. We just delivered the RNA and the cell processed, and the protein was functional. So we knew at that point that the RNA will be good for something, maybe for, you know, treating cells. But um, uh, I had to move on, and I moved to neurosurgery, where again, we were trying to uh, develop something for therapy. I worked at, at that bench here for 17 years. I made all of the RNA up until 2013. And um, well, with uh, David, we uh, tried to generate some RNA for uh, therapy for uh, stroke, but most of what we were doing is improving the RNA performance, so translation level increase. I was always wanted to deliver an RNA which goes for a therapeutic protein, so I was not much worried about uh, immunogenicity up until I met uh, Drew Weissman, and it really happened at the Xerox machine, and uh, we were chatting, and then I made a gag mRNA for him because he was interested to develop uh, HIV-specific uh, uh, vaccine and, and therapeutic or prophylactic vaccine. And when he uh, tested out in human uh, immune cells, they called human dendritic cells, he delivered the gag RNA with the lipofectin, which is a positively charged lipid. He found that this uh, RNA is a fantastic vaccine because so much protein was produced. It also activated all kind of uh, activation marker. It was so immunogenic and he was so happy, but I was not because I want to make therapeutic protein coding RNA. And then, you know, for delivering to a, a patient with stroke and inflammatory molecule is the last thing you want to do. So we were thinking with Drew why, why this RNA is um, inflammatory. And uh, because inside the cell we have RNA and in our body every cell we have RNA and is, uh, we don't get any inflammation. But we were thinking that maybe because it is coming to the Im immune cells from outside, it recognizes an invader. So to figure out what we what is going on, what we have done, we isolated uh, mammalian RNA from different compartments and tested out on uh, dendritic cells and measured inflammatory molecules, which is TNF-alpha. And in purple, you can see those RNA I made, which was in vitro transcribed, and these others, the isolated, were not as inflammatory, but interestingly, one of the RNA, which was the tRNA, was not inflammatory at all. And this gave us the idea, could it be that nucleoside modification is responsible for uh, lacking inflammatory uh, reaction? But uh, how we could prove that? If we look at, of course, we can see this correlation, you know, the in vitro transcribe, which I made, is very inflammatory. 
zero modification, most modified, not inflammatory. So it could be a correlation or it was a cause of effect. Originally and, and naturally, all of, all of the RNA in your body actually is made by the four basic nucleotides. And these modifications, which is present in the tRNA and other RNA, they are introduced by different enzymes. So, and these, uh, at that point, was not much known about these uh, nucleoside modification. There were a lot of them, as you can see. But those enzymes which can introduce these different modifications to the nucleoside is, was not known. Not that we could just uh, order one and test out and put on the mRNA. So we had to use a different method. We had to order nucleoside triphosphate, which was already contained modification. So we ordered quite a different one. We insisted that we are just ordering those which naturally present in our body human body to make sure that we don't cause any uh, adverse effect. And uh, luckily, five of them incorporated by this uh, T7 RNA polymerase, phage polymerase, and we could generate these uh, RNA. This is a gel picture is shown here. And then we started to test it out. And when we added it to the uh, human dendritic cells, we found that some of them were not inflammatory, did not induce any TNF alpha. So when we looked at the closer to what are those, we found that uh, all of them had a uridine, modified uridine. So the next question was, now we can make uh, RNA, which is non-inflammatory, but we want to make a, a vaccine, which calls for some antigen, so translation is was critical. So when we tested out whether these uh, nucleoside modified RNA can translate, we were surprised to find that the pseudo-uridine containing uh, RNA, messenger RNA, produce 10 times more protein, 10 times more than the natural uridine-containing RNA. And we spent like two, three years to find, try to find out why. Uh, but uh, we also did an experiment where we already tried to identify that what is the uridine-containing RNA is activating. And um, why we tested our toll-like receptors, because Professor Akir uh, here, you know, already identified toll-like receptor 9, for example, that activated by DNA. And in 2001, we also learned that the double-stranded RNA can activate toll-like receptor 3. What we found is that toll-like receptor 7 and 8 was those receptors which are sensing uridine-containing RNA, because when we modified, we didn't find any signal, but when we had unmodified, it activated. Later, 10 years later, they demonstrated that toll-like receptor 9 crystal structure demonstrated that already even the nucleoside itself can help to dimerize toll-like receptor 8. And toll 7 is also very sensitive to uridine. Crystal structure shows how the uridine is uh, located in, in those uh, uh, toll-like receptors. And that's what explanation. What happened after that, we published, but nobody was interested. I was invited only one uh, lecture, and this right here in Sapporo, when um, uh, we gathered here. And then first time I presented about the modified nucleoside and what this RNA mo with modification can do. Here I am in the first row, and my colleague Hiromi here, and Professor Akira was here. And uh, so it was an exciting time. First time I was here in Japan in 2006. So others was not interested, but we had so much work to do, so we were not waiting. And we started a purification. We could see that TOR3 was activated by this uh, RNA, so we suspected double-stranded RNA was there. And we had a, a detection method. But after working out the purification method, we could eliminate those contaminants. And as a result of it, you can see that those which were not purified, they induced, uh, or it is a heat map showing all of these uh, cytokines level was increased by uridine, pseudouridine, or double modified RNA. But after purification, you can see pseudouridine containing RNA did not induce those. As a result of it, we also get great improvement of the translation especially human dendritic cells, primary cells, you know, several log more protein was produced. So finally, we have pure, modified, and uh, modified and uh, very effective uh, RNA. And um, with my colleague, 
Hiromi Muramatsu, we started a lot of animal experiments. Here, for erythropoietin encoding RNA, we inject it to the animals. And when uh, this erythropoietin, those who are following the uh, bicycle race, knows that EPO is increasing red blood cell production. And so what we did, uh, we used this mRNA delivered with transit to the animals, and we could see that after injection, 30 minutes later, we could already detect the protein was circulating in animals. And then uh, up to four days, we could measure the EPO level. But when we injected just the protein, because the half-life is very short, it's disappeared. Or the U-containing RNA also disappeared very quickly. And it was the produced protein was functional because it increased the hematocrit. Here is rent, you can see. And when weekly injected a small dose, 0.1 microgram to the animal, we could maintain high level of uh, hematocrit in those animals. And most importantly, here in center, you can see that the mRNA was non-inflammatory, whereas the uridine-containing RNA was inflammatory. So this was 2012. And then again, I visited, together with Drew Weissman, we visited Japan, because uh, Takeda was interested, uh, you know, the procedure, we are doing mRNA delivery, they had formulation, and we visited them. Unfortunately, this is the only picture two of us is present in a Chinese restaurant, but um, we were in the Shan Center and met scientists and we were interested to collaborate with them. But it uh, didn't work out. So in 2013, with uh, Hiromi, we moved to Germany from uh, University of Pennsylvania, where we worked. And here we combined our effort with Ugo Zain and his wife, Özlem Türeci. And in the BioNTech, we started further optimizing the mRNA. Because as I told you, this is the whole story in the uh, incremental improvement of the RNA uh, performance. Did the uh, codon optimization, optimized the untranslated region, purified, and uh, all kind of uh, improvement we made formulation. And uh, what happened as a result of it, what I showed you, the tiny amount of protein for short period of time, now that with all of this improvement, we could make a lot of protein for quite a long time, which already could be used for uh, therapy. And that's what we started. We started to make a, a therapeutic uh, mRNA, coding for therapeutic protein, and one was this bispecific antibody, which uh, recognizing a, a cancer-specific uh, uh, molecule, clothing 6, and also the T cells. And then it clo brings close proximity, this bispecific antibody, the immune cells and the cancer cells. And uh, in the, uh, it is already different kind of uh, uh, bispecific antibodies are in the clinic, but the patient had to uh, wear pumps because the half-life is very short. In the animal model, we could show that uh, whereas uh, protein had to be every second day was in injected, mRNA was sufficient to inject uh, weekly. And then we could eliminate already established uh, large tumor in animals. This uh, 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 program will, in BioNTech will go to uh, clinic. Another study, actually, we demonstrated in last year when uh, instead of uh, vaccination, we can use the RNA for tolerization. And the mRNA here is, it is, a, again, a nucleoside-modified RNA, one methyl pseudouridine, and it uh, codes for the autoantigen and repeated delivery to different animal model of uh, multiple sclerosis, we could demonstrate that uh, uh, repeated injection can induce tolerization in these animals. The lipid formulation is uh, different as uh, not like in the uh, vaccines, but these are co not containing ionizable lipids so that it is uh, not activating uh, any uh, those molecules. We also did uh, studies and again, this was the first one actually, which I participated at BioNTech, where we are, we were injecting animals, which had, a, a, here is a melanoma model, and they injected a cell surface close uh, tumor, and uh, the mRNA coded for four different cytokines. And that uh, procedure is uh, converting the cold tumor to hot, and these cytokines is produced by the uh, tumor cells and inviting uh, uh, immune cells to this uh, area, and they are recognizing what 
the tumor look like, and then circulating in the body can eliminate already established uh, metastatic uh, uh, cancer cells. And here shown that, uh, you know, the black spot on the lung, which was uh, in the animal injected with this uh, uh, cytokine mixture, mRNA, they did not have this uh, metastatic spot. This uh, study with, uh, together with Sanofi is in a clinical trial already for a patient. Meanwhile, we were working uh, in the BioNTech, uh, colleagues at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Norbert Pardy, together with uh, Drew Weissman, were uh, advancing the vaccine program. And uh, here in uh, 2017, they published uh, together with us is that uh, uh, messenger RNA, which uh, contains one methyl pseudouridin uh, and uh, coding for the Zika viral uh, premembrane envelope protein, and uh, it's formulated in aqueous uh, lipid nanoparticle, and that is uh, very effective. They tested out in mice and monkeys, and what was important that very very small amount. 50 microgram was sufficient uh, to induce very high level of antibody in, in the monkeys. And uh, those were also protective when animals were challenged. If you get a uh, uh, BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccine, you probably get the vaccine which was very similar to that one. And this was the first when one methyl pseudouridin containing mRNA formulated with aqueous um, lipid nanoparticle was used. What was very uh, exciting is that the dose was very small. In, in mice, 50 microgram was sufficient. In mo monkeys, it was 50 microgram was sufficient. And you couldn't see it before when it was a, a DNA-based uh, vaccine they tried to use. Then on proportionally, they had to increase. And finally, human was injected with milligrams of, uh, of uh, DNA-containing vaccine. Actually, this paper just last month got the Biol Award, which was the uh, last 10 years most important publication. Subsequently, uh, Drew, probably he will talk about other studies uh, with um, demonstrated that similarly formulated uh, uh, vaccines against uh, influenza and, um, uh, and uh, HIV in animal models were very, very effective. So as a result of it, of course, uh, we at the BioNTech, together working with Pfizer for 2018 already to develop a vaccine for uh, influenza, was uh, the program was switched over when the COVID pandemic happened and, and the vaccine was developed. And uh, you are aware of that uh, information was available in January 2020. And uh, by end of the year, already uh, many of us, uh, we received already the uh, vaccine. So many, and uh, of course it was FDA approved, uh, fully approved in last uh, August. And many people thought that this is the first time when actually um, an, uh, nucleoside modified mRNA was injected in, in a human being, but uh, let me tell you, it's not so. Uh, mRNA, this, uh, uh, pseudouridin containing RNA was already in advanced clinical trial for heart failure and VGFA mRNA, which um, this mRNA codes for a protein which form new blood vessels. And they injected it to the heart to patient who are undergoing uh, uh, elective bypass surgery. 30 different spot in, in the uh, muscle was injected. It is naked RNA, not uh, lipid nano particle formulated, and the study already uh, started uh, way before pandemic happened. So, and this uh, uh, program advanced very well, and uh, this year, January, we learned that uh, the patient uh, did so well, those heart failure patients, that this will uh, enter in next, the phase three clinical trial. So this was uh, successful. Another success story was uh, by um, uh, Intelia reported, and this is an uh, amyloidosis, this is a disease uh, which uh, when the patient is uh, uh, diagnosed with this disease, is about like five years later, they, they die. And uh, the cause of this disease is that the patients are making a toxic uh, uh, protein, and uh, 
and uh, this uh, protein had to be eliminated. And what Intelia did, uh, they generated uh, Cas9 mRNA. This is a, a protein this, uh, uh, which can editing the genome, and then, of course, they added the guide RNA. And when it is translated, the uh, Cas9 in the cytoplasma with the guide protein entered to the nuclei and then interrupted to the genes which uh, was responsible for production of this toxic protein. So these patients generated no more toxic uh, protein. And uh, just the last uh, uh, month, it was shown that uh, one year after uh, initiation of this study, and this uh, patient received only one, one injection. Those uh, three patients who had the higher dose, they were still not making this toxic protein. So it seems now that uh, the promise of the uh, gene therapy actually will be fulfilled by the RNA. And uh, with that, I would like to thank to all of my colleagues who helped me through the years and um, uh, work in the uh, University of Pennsylvania and, uh, and uh, in BioNTech. And uh, also I would like to thank to, to my family. Uh, my daughter is a two times Olympic champion and usually in the end I always show her picture because I want to leave the high end. And uh, here we were in London that uh, in rowing she got the gold medal. Actually I usually mention that the rowing and science is very similar. And the rower is going backwards. They don't say, see where is the finish line. And they are just pulling like crazy. And this is we scientists are similar. We don't see, we don't even know that when we are pulling, whether we are going to the right direction, but we are pulling that, imagine that there is a finish line. And when we reach it, you know, we start another race. And, and of course my husband who <laughs> supported us. And so that's my message, you know, to all of those, uh, girls that they have to also find a good husband that who supports their dream and thank you very much for your attention